Tolerate you curiouser and curiouser Hurley Burleyites. Welcome to this live recording of our podcast here at the Maple Leaf Food Security Symposium at the Globe and Mail Center. You've heard of the Hurley Burley, right? We're now in our sixth triumphant year of helping to keep Canadians informed and our sixth unsuccessful year of shameless shilling for sponsorship from either Hawkins Cheesies or Lemon Heart Rum. Today on the pod, we've brought together a policy panel to look at the issues surrounding food security. Dr. Jennifer Robson has held senior roles in policy development and research with the federal government. She's now the program director and associate professor of political management at Carleton University. Her primary areas of research are at the intersection of household finances and the design of social policy. Pretty relevant. Tyler Meredith is the former head of fiscal and economic policy for Prime Minister Trudeau and ministers of finance Christia Freeland and Bill Morneau, leading the charge on delivering six federal budgets and five fall economic statements. Today, he's a founding partner at Meredith Bosenkuhl Phillips Policy Advisors. And Ginny Roth, a hurly burly first timer, is a lifelong political activist and former staffer and campaigner for the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. She's now a partner at Crestview Strategy, advising some of the largest food and beverage consumer packaged goods and pharma companies in the world. And if you don't know me, my name is David Hurley. I fantasize about playing tight end for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, and I've got a 30-year background in public opinion research. I've led political and campaign strategy for Ralph Goodale, Prime Minister Paul Martin, Premier Kathleen Wynne, among others. Today, I'm a partner at Rubicon Strategy, as well as a Canadian political podcast mogul. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as a Canadian political podcast mogul. So here's what we'll be talking about today. What are strategies for addressing food security? How does the political process react to these kinds of issues? What role can programming play, income support, and all the issues that have been discussed at this conference today? So thanks for coming, all of you. Glad Thanks to be for having us. Good, Good to, to be here. Yeah. I think we can all agree, just to start, by the way, that Andre Picard is a national here. gem. Mm-hmm. Here. Um, <laughs> all the panelists were great, but Andre's depth of understanding and experience is quite, quite something. So the question I want to start you off with, because you're also experienced in this, is Sarah mentioned that I do polling for the Maple Leaf Center, and the polling that I do for them indicates a much higher level of concern about poverty in Canada than one sees reflected in the political discourse generally. These things, when you put them into batteries and polls, pop up much higher than the general sort of airspace they take up in the debate. Jennifer, do you have any idea why that is? Well, I think that's a recognition of kind of a common value of a commitment towards fairness, towards inclusion in the country. But your question about why don't we see that in terms of priorities within public policy or why is it uneven? Why, why, is, there, why is it not as reflected in the political discussion as right. it is in, in the hearts and minds of Canadians? Uh, on this one, I'm, I'm actually just going to theorize on this one, so I'm going to wax philosophical a little bit. I think it has to do with the fact that um, poverty and insecurity is often seen as, an, it's the problem of others, right? Here, this is a conversation that is more about food security, which unfortunately impacts many people who are above the poverty line. Um, so that's where I think you might actually see some greater recognition and traction. But I think a lot of it has to do with an othering, that it is other people who are poor, uh, it is other people who uh, maybe through their own misfortune fall into low income without a recognition that it, it, like so many of us are one paycheck away, right? Right. Um, I, I, that's that's my me waxing philosophic on that cool. one. Ginny, what's your take on this? Um, I mean, you're the pollster, so far be it for me. But I think I might reject the premise a little bit. Okay. Um, I accept the polling certainly, but the political discourse. I mean, you've got a federal government that's committed to a national food program. Um, and talks about a lot of its programming, including that program, including the child benefit enhancements early in its um, tenure in government, as explicitly being designed to tackle poverty, at least in part, among other things. Um, And then you have a leader of the opposition who, if you believe the polls, is likely to form government after the next federal election, who, I'm going to say at least weekly, in social media posts, is talking about food banks, um, the growing demand for food banks, Um, and expressing great dismay at that. And I think that that is political actors across the spectrum applying their various lenses and solution sets 
to this broad-based feeling of insecurity. I agree um, with Jen that a lot of people don't want to um, describe themselves as poor. Poor is a hard word. Yeah. Um, but everyone is describing themselves as insecure. Like upper middle class people are describing themselves as insecure because whether it's their mortgage payments um, or the cost of the grocery stores, even for people um, who consider themselves middle income, they feel really insecure. They feel insecure for all kinds of reasons. Maybe they can't even pinpoint why. And politicians respond to that kind of thing. And yeah. so I think there's a real opportunity for policy leaders to influence the ways that politicians choose to respond. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really big opportunity for people in this room. Right. So, Tyler, you have the most recent experience in government. So if I say to people in these polls, would you rather reduce poverty and food insecurity or balance the federal budget? Three quarters of people said I'd rather <laughs> deal, reduce poverty and food insecurity. That's great, uh, because um, I, I do think that there is sometimes moments of activism where governments want to walk through that, when, walk through that door uh, and actually do something about it. And, and I think, to Jenny's point, you've seen a fair bit of interest at the federal level in the course of the last number of years to want to reach towards a goal of poverty reduction, of, of cutting poverty rates in half, which absent um, some recent uh, you know, bump off the course because of inflation, we've, we've actually been working our way closely and closely towards. Um, but I think what's interesting, though, is uh, there's also a political dynamic here, right? That as much as governments can kind of be focused, especially if they have the time and focus, if they're a majority government, to spend time on doing the big things that you need to do those things, um, there's a basic political problem about how you deal with poverty. And that is poor people don't vote or they don't vote in the same numbers as most people, certainly higher income people. Yep. And I believe that one of the challenges of how you get to where we are today to potentially cutting rates of poverty fully in half or even going further than that is that we actually have to bring poor people into our political uh, mechanisms and to our, into our political institutions. And I think part of that is because there's like this mismatch in the market where some leaders have not understood that there's actually a political organizing opportunity around lower income people, and so they've not pursued policies in the way that they pursue policies to speak to certain clientele groups um, that speak to that constituency, and vice versa, I think, because there hasn't been that on offer uh, of the kind of you do, you, know, you do X for me and I will vote for you kind of politics that we've seen at both the federal and the provincial level in the last number of years, that has discouraged people who are lower income from voting. And so um, I also hang my hat at the Maytree Foundation, and this is actually one of the things that I'm quite interested in looking at because um, I think that there is a huge missed political organizing opportunity for whoever wants to go and take on that issue. Poverty is a one in 10 issue in Canada. One, about one in 10 people are, are poor if we accept the definition of the market basket measure. I'll, I'll fight with people who want to use other <laughs> measures, but, uh, but if we accept that, one in 10 people are poor. And, Ordinarily in politics, we sometimes think that one in ten issues are not the kind of things that motivate people. But there are lots of examples, whether it's pharmacare or elsewhere, where it's a small number of people who would benefit from it. But to Jen's point, it speaks to a value that lots of other people care about. And if you get people mobilized, they actually will change politics. Interesting. Okay. Um, one of the... Jennifer, just as a, a baseline setting exercise, okay. I'd like to draw on your expertise here. One of the shocking things people here have heard today at this symposium is um, from Neil Hetherington about the dramatic increase in the number of people using food banks. Yeah. Like multi-fold yeah. increase in the number of people using food banks. Surely people's financial situation, the economy hasn't deteriorated to that level. What has driven this? Yeah. What is the underlying cause of this? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's not the carbon tax. I just want to lay that out right now. <laughs> um, so, um, um, what's driving this? Um, look, spending on food is one of the first things that you see change within a household when they're under financial strain. Um, because it's a lot easier to go without groceries for a short bit than to not pay your rent and then be be without housing, right? right. So it's kind of that, that part of the budget flex that we see, unfortunately, suffer the soonest, right? It's sort of like an early warning system. Um, what's driving it? Well, look, uh, inflation is back down, right? 1.6% yeah. was the number yesterday. That, that's, look, that's great news. No, but prices are still where prices are. Wages have grown, but unevenly, right, across the income distribution, and certainly not quite at the same pace to be able to keep up with rising shelter prices as well as, to some degree, food prices. Add to that, um, we've, you know, Tyler's right, we have made really good progress in this country in terms of reducing poverty rates. 
enormous gains in, in terms of financial security for seniors. Important improvements for working age adults and especially kids as well. But on top of that, um, there are a bunch of households in this country who um, exhibit other who basically are showing other symptoms of financial insecurity. They may not be poor, yeah. but they, they couldn't handle a $500 expense if one hit them out of the blue, mm-hmm. right? Um, they, they, they don't have much by way of liquid savings um, for a rainy day or anything like that. And there's about 18%, we think, thereabouts, of households that experience within-year income volatility. So overall, over the whole year, their income might be not too bad, but they go through these dry spells. And what happens when they go through those dry spells? Well, food insecurity. Right. Jenny, do you think if there were people with full-time employment lining up at the food bank, do you think we're defining poverty wrong in this country? I think that... um this question of why is really important. And people from different political traditions look for different reasons. Um, I think one of the challenges for people who are advocating for big national programs administered at the federal level is that we've now had almost a decade of of government with the, uh, in in many cases, either majority or can act as though they have a majority um, political dynamic uh, for the liberals, a left of center liberal party supported by the NDP, um, who, who took this approach, right? who said um, we might uh, be willing to increase taxes a little bit, um, including uh, parts of a taxation like the carbon tax, um, because we believe in the power of national programs um, to fix these kinds of problems. And despite all that, we have... Um, these new shocking statistics from food banks. And so for, for people from the, the right of the spectrum like me, um, who are inclined to have certain um, philosophical approaches to the economy, they see uh, an economy where uh, demand is up and supply is down. And um, there are all sorts of reasons for that. You can talk about geopolitics for sure. Um, but there's also, I think, a pretty strong argument that it's in fact the government spending um, beyond its means, that has contributed to that inflation. And so I think um, you're going to see a, a lot of room for a story about how um, get part of getting inflation under control is growing the economy by getting the government out of the way, getting government spending down, and creating more jobs. But not just that, um, because people are, are employed uh, at, a, at a pretty good rate right now. Having those people's paychecks be able to buy them more um, and getting prices back under control so that the person who feels like I, uh, someone earlier today talked about the broken social contract of like, I worked hard, I played by the rules, I got an education, I got a great job. Why is it that I can't fill my car with gas, buy groceries, and afford just basics? Not, not luxuries, just basics. That contract is broken. I think that's because some, some basics in the supply and demand of the economy are broken. Can I challenge that? Sure. <laughs> so, and, and I, I don't disagree with Ginny that that's, that's the formulation. I think that is the formulation that we've heard from the, op- the leader of the opposition and others. But let's just decompose government spending for a second. The reason that Government of Canada has as deficit as large as it has, largely, is explained by about five things. The fact that we had a six to seven billion dollar a year tax cut that has taken money out of the income tax system for the middle class, which by the way, both the Liberals and the Conservatives had versions of that in their platforms before. Two, an increase in OAS benefits. We've talked about that before, right? For those who are most senior, uh, not necessarily helping all people who are most poor, but some people who are potentially at risk later in life. Three uh, is a national childcare program. Four is the GST credit enhancements that we've done in the last several budgets that go to the, mo- the poorest people to help protect them during an inflation crisis. And five is the cost associated with Indigenous claims and settlements. So there's other stuff there, but more or less the five big things are those five things. The Conservatives probably would have supported every single one of those things that I just mentioned. Maybe they would have changed the way childcare was allocated. Maybe they would have done something different on housing. Maybe they would have oh, substituted yes. OES. Well, okay, mm-hmm. but okay, well then that, that's that's fair. But my point is, most of those things, all parties in our country <coughs> more or less actually agree on. And so if we if we believe that the problem is spending, we we have to probably touch some things that we're not comfortable as Canadians actually touching. Okay. Such as? Well, 
I mean, I, this is my point, is that I think we're not going to touch any of those things as spending. And so I think the question then becomes, do we have the right level of taxation and do we have the right interventions in programs, whether it's housing, whether it's supporting people um, with disabilities and so forth. And by the way, I didn't mention the Canada Disability Benefit because it hasn't kicked in yet, right? That's another $1.7 billion per year in spending. You want to talk about inflation, that's, I mean, it's, it's actually, it, it will cause inflation, but it's a good thing that we need to do, right? It's not anti-inflationary. It will cause inflation. I think you've made this point on another early, early podcast, Jen. Um, but it's the thing that we have to do if we want to address poverty, right? So in my, in my mind, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a spending problem. It's maybe do, are we spending it on the right things or are we doing the things that will actually lift people across that poverty line? That's maybe a discussion that I hope we have in this country over the course of the next year as we get into an election. Cookie cutter. Here's a term you hear often applied to new home development. As in, geez, will you look at this neighborhood? It's just cookie cutter houses. Well, we've been talking about TELUS living here for a few weeks now. Their new, mixed-use, purpose-built rental residential portfolio. It's the antithesis of cookie cutter hurly burlyites. By definition, you can't be cookie cutter if innovation is at the heart of what you're doing. So let me tell you some of the ways Talus Living stands apart from other new builds in the market. Advanced technological integration. Talus Living properties are equipped with Talus's state of the art fiber optic connectivity and smart home solutions. Community centered design. These homes come in a variety of layouts and unit sizes with features that foster community engagement, including community gardens, fitness centers, and co-working spaces. Commitment to accessibility and affordability. TELUS Living aims to provide purpose-built rental units for middle-class families and essential workers, typically within 40% of household income. Built with proximity in mind so that essential workers have housing in a convenient location to their workplaces. Sustainable development practices. The project adheres to high environmental standards, incorporating energy efficient systems, sustainable materials, and green building practices. I could go on and tell you about holistic living experiences like access to TELUS's communications, health, and well being services, but I think in the last month or so, we've been talking about this, so you're getting the picture. By leveraging their expertise in connectivity and innovation, TELUS Living is redefining what it means to create vibrant, sustainable, and connected communities, and in the process, transforming cookie cutter into cutting edge. Go to TELUSLiving.com to learn more. So we're here to talk about food security. Ginny, maybe I could ask you, do you think that is sort of syn synonymous with poverty, or is, that a, or is food insecurity a unique issue? that's different from just poverty? I think um, if you go too far down a path of trying to prescribe, particularly when you're talking about federal policy, right? I think the more, and this is a, um, I'm a, uh, I don't know if there's a, a word called subsidiarist, but I'm a, I'm a adherent to subsidiarity. And I think if you um, get too prescribed about the nature of the problem you're trying to solve and too narrow about it, um, particularly for a government, a level of government that's really far away from everyday people and that's dealing um, with people in the millions, not in the, the dozens or the hundreds or the thousands, um, you start to risk um, missing the, the, the forest for the trees or missing the trees for the forest. Um, and, and poverty um, is easier to get at, I think, and solve than something like food insecurity. Um, <coughs> and so um, I think poverty is... Uh, I, think, I think if you target poverty and have success, you'll probably also target food insecurity. Um, that, that's not always going to be true. There are cases of like food deserts, for instance, that are really practical problems for people in, in neighborhoods and communities. But I think those communities are best um, situated to solve those very specific niche tailored problems. Poverty is a problem at the national level. And to kind of to build on, on Tyler's point, I don't want to give the impression that um, people from my side of the political spectrum um, don't think there's a role for the federal government to play in, t in supporting, particularly people who can't support themselves, right? It's the child benefit, the disability benefit, really targeted programs to redistribute uh, revenue to people who can't work. 
um, kids and people with disabilities. That's, a, that's an important role for the federal government to play. Um, and that, I think, is where you do have consensus on spending, yeah, by the agree. way. Um, and I think there are ways that we can enhance those programs. Um, and and when, if, if we prioritize them, maybe even um, invest in them um, more fully. Um, but that's how I would think about poverty. And then you have a, a separate pro- challenge, which is people who can't work, uh, people who can work, rather, and are either underemployed, unemployed, underemployed, or employed, and their paychecks aren't able to buy them the basic necessities, and and that's where I think we probably differ more on solutions to what those what the, um, what solutions look like to those problems. Right. What do you think, Jennifer? Is it an income issue, or is it a broader than an income issue? Well, um, so here I I do have to give credit to the folks at Proof at U of T who said, look, you, a big part of food security is essentially it's income security, right? Like if people have enough income, then they can actually obtain food. However, I. I That's obviously there is a huge role for the federal government to play in that. That said, um, let's maybe think a little bit more creatively as well, right? That there there are there was an earlier discussion um, here around social prescribing, for Mm -hmm. example. Um, So the you know the federal government can play a role in terms of of the supply side of of our food systems, right? Um, I know there was a there was a conversation, for example, around food sovereignty for indigenous communities. There's a huge federal role there as well. Um, I think, you know, we, we have to talk as well about, like, how we have a system in Canada, or multiple systems in Canada, for how we all obtain food. Um, it costs all of us money, obviously, so the money matters. But we can also start to think about, um, for example, competition policy, agricultural policy, um, infrastructure policy as other tools maybe to get at this, at, at this issue as well. Right. Tyler, what was the government thinking, if you could reveal a little bit, as it saw inflation move and it saw the cost of housing go up? By, like we, I hear these stats that over the last five years, cost of food's up 25 points. Yeah. Cost of housing is up 25%. Yeah. Um, it's pretty obvious what the impact on people is going to be. How does the government react to something like that? So I think that in, in the government has gone, in fairness, through several phases of its thinking and response to inflation. It hasn't been one sole response. Because I think um, we did live through a period of time in the pandemic, uh, and that lasted much longer than people thought, where we kind of wondered, is this natural relationship between the size of the money supply and inflation? Because those two, those two things historically have been related, that if you expand money supply, you get eventually you get inflation. And this is where I think... Pierre I heard this from the leader of the opposition. Yeah, and I think, I, I think Pierre has actually been very effective on this. I, and he, he's not wrong. His, di- his solutions, I think, are wrong. But he's not wrong to point to that as, as, as an issue. And so we were living through about a year and a half in the pandemic where we'd see money supply grow and there'd be no effect on inflation. And so people literally were asking themselves at some points, you know, is this relationship broken? Like, is this... Are, and that actually is the right question to be asking at that point in time, right? Because it was fascinating to actually see almost zero inflation at some points in time mm-hmm. uh, during the pandemic. And then, of course, it built up and, and it really burst, you know, on, it really burst into people's experience in 2022. And I think everyone around the world was, was slow, central banks, governments, um, in correcting to the kinds of things that we needed to do. But when you, when you have to correct, you're left with very few good choices, right? Because you have some people who say, well, the solution to the problem of inflation is to let interest rates surge. That's something that Mark Carney has said, right, um, that we should do in order to solve the problem as quickly as possible. That could be an extremely controversial thing to do, potentially. Um, and I'm not sure that, that uh, it would get the problem under control, potentially, but it might not solve the composition of the inflation that we were facing at that time. Number two, you could, you could help to shore people up with some degree of income to protect particularly the lowest 50% of people who are most exposed to the cost of essentials like food and housing and so forth and don't have an ability to adjust their consumption. Uh, And governments around the world kind of did that. We did that in Canada. It was a kind of a consensus between provincial and federal governments to do it. But that is, to a certain extent, inflationary. But we've accepted that that's an okay thing to do because we need to do it. And I think it was actually generally uncontroversial between levels of government. It's why actually when the government, after uh, the summer of 2022, uh, Mr. Trudeau came back from, from the summer and announced that we were expanding the GST rebate. He got basically immediate unanimous consent of the House to accelerate that bill through, through Parliament and in a time 
of, of, of unanimity that we haven't kind of seen in other points in this parliament um, because that was the right thing to do. And the third is to say, well, you could solve some of these supply side interventions, right? whether it's housing or working on competition policy. But those are very long-term fixes to the problem. Those are not going to solve today's inflation. In fact, those are going to solve inflation years from now, but it's the right thing to do and we need to get on with doing it. But so you're left with this problem where you kind of have to live with it. You have to live with dealing with inflation. You have to live with interest rates being high. That's a painful period to be through. And I think it's a pain that the government is now dealing with. Uh, can I just jump? Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. You go ahead, Jen. I, was, I just wanted to say that in addition to the federal spending, I think we always lose track of the fact that virtually every provincial government in this country did a helicopter drop of money as well. That's right. Right? As, in, right. as part of the reopening and as part right. of the sort of affordability pressures. So, like, I, I just, I think, just in fairness, I just wanted to add that, That's you know, right. there's a lot, there's a lot of blame to be, to be spread around on this one. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just say there, there are, I think, two other components to addressing inflation beyond just re trying to reduce spending and getting, get it sort of reasonably in line. Um, and one is um, deregulation. I mean, when you think about housing, um, and housing, I think, is relevant to this po question of poverty and insecurity. Um, we are low on supply. There's too much demand and too little supply, and a big part of the reason we're low on supply is because we're overregulated, overzoned, um, yes. and deregulating yes. uh, and fixing that challenge. And you can apply that, by the way, to other parts of, um, of the economy as well. Uh, and the third is demand. Um, you know, the, the, uh, there's been a pro-immigration consensus in Canada for a long time. I think, by the way, that consensus still holds. Um, but the uh, inbound um, number of new Canadians over this past year, and um, to, a, to a lesser extent in years uh, prior, um, but in the last decade or so, has been unprecedented, basically, since um, apart from decades and decades ago when we were growing so fast as a country. And we haven't had the capacity to absorb that demand um, in our economy. Uh, we have too, too little of what too many people need. And so, that, and that's why you get, by the way, I think the scarcity cropping up in the polling, because people feel like they're fighting for a bigger size of a pie that's the same size, and there are more people who want a bigger slice. Right. Uh, that scarcity environment, I think the only solution for it is an abundance agenda, um, mm -hmm. where you, you develop a policy worldview that, that, that um, supports abundance, and supports abundance ideally in the real economy. Um, yeah. Can I just say, I agree 100% with Ginny on that. Like, and I, I think the challenge for progressives in this country, for those who are center, center left, left voters uh, and, and politicians, is that I think the abundance agenda has been stolen or taken over or led or whatever, whatever term we want to use by, by, the, by conservative movements. And, and, I, and I think there's a real risk for progressives that if they don't get out in front of this um, long term, it's going to cause uh, generational problems because I think and you know this is now going back into a history that I didn't live through. But managing scarcity is not a great slogan. <laughs> <laughs> but like people's perceptions of how to deal with inflation matter as to which generation you're in, right? So if you lived through inflation in the '70s and '80s, you have a very different experience and viewpoint about how to solve that problem than millennials who grew up in a period of time where inflation and prices were stable for a long period of time, and it, it's like this thing that never happens that we have to deal with, right? And 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 so I think if if we've all now lived through this experience. Um, if governments and political parties don't figure out which way they want to go long term to solving this problem, and abundance is definitely part of how you solve that, um, I think we're at risk of, of uh, seeing generational change um, in, how, uh, in, in how political parties are engaged with those groups. There is a phrase used by railroaders at our sponsor, CN. They talk about the CN way. It's an intriguing phrase. I did a little reading about it recently, and as far as I can tell, it was coined decades ago by the chief executive and former Privy Council clerk who guided the railroad from being a money-losing crown corporation to the efficient, industry-leading Class 1 railroad it is today. But even Paul Tellier had trouble defining the phrase. The CN way is not Canadian, he once said, and it is not American. Among other things, he said it is an instinct to challenge convention and an openness to new ideas. Since then, other CN leaders have used the phrase in talking about diversity, about treating colleagues and shareholders and clients with respect, about taking responsibility for the railway's impact on the lives of those it touches, about embracing innovation and striving for excellence. And of course, operating with primary regard for people's safety, railroaders, customers, and the people who live along the CN network. If that all sounds sort of Pollyannish, well, whatever. I think it probably boils down to something pretty simple, trying to do the right thing. 
It might be a hard concept to define precisely in the execution, but you know, we all know it when we see it. As I record this, it is Thanksgiving in Canada, and it strikes me that the CN way is a perfect means for actualizing gratitude for the life we enjoy in this country. You really can't go wrong trying to do the right thing. It's that simple. All right, Jennifer, I'm going to come back and start with you. One of the things that has surprised me most in the research that I've done, mm-hmm. doing it for five years now, is the consistent, broad support for a basic income mm-hmm. safety net mm-hmm. in the economy. It is astonishing to me, about 70, 75% of Canadians support say that they support this idea. And when we ask people whether what they would say their three top priorities would be, 25% say that. Do you ask them that question after having asked about the would you support basic income in general? Yeah. Like are they, they're kind of already thinking? Yeah. Okay. So then I ask them of a long list of things, which three things are most important to you. 25% of people will put basic income among their three most important things. Now, it's an idea that's controversial even in this room. Yeah. Right? And the Premier of Newfoundland this morning told me he doesn't really support it, even though he's very progressive on these things. What do right. you think about it? So I had the, um, the pleasure of uh, being part of a wider network of, of researchers who were contributing to the BC Basic Income panel. So for anybody in this room, whether you're for or against, but you have, you think, oh, maybe we need a study. BC has actually already done a lot of the legwork. Um, <laughs> so like, you know, we're indebted to them. Um, so that, uh, that task force, I think, highlighted a couple of, of really important points, which is number one, um, there are a lot of different ways to to make a basic income, right? Like it's many Devils different ways. In the details, for exactly, sure. right? And those are non-trivial in terms of thinking about the costs. Right. And once you get to the number of the costs, I'm really curious to know in your polling, if you ask people, would you pay higher taxes to be able to afford a basic income for your fellow citizens? I'd be really super interested to know whether or not you get support for that because a lot of the discussion around basic income is predicated under a belief that if we could just take the existing spending in a bunch of different envelopes and somehow miraculously bundle it all together, um, that we could just use all the same amount of money and have so much better impact. And all of the research on this suggests that if you were to do that um, there would be an important share of people who actually are in need and who would be left out, an important part of that population, or who would be worse off, worse off right? Because their benefits would effectively be right. cut if you tried to bundle right. all that together. And a lot of those people would be persons with disabilities. By which you mean, just to, for instance, not buying wheelchairs for disabled people, for somebody that needs a well, wheelchair? Or even, even just their monthly income benefits that they rely on for would be lower. all... It would be lowered, okay. right? Because right. If, you're, if you're kind of, you know, regressed to the mean, right? Yeah. And then the other uh, real challenge that the BC Basic Income Panel, I think, identified correctly was that in addition to the complexity of reconciling this patchwork of, of our systems right now, we have a real administrative challenge, right? Like, uh, the patchwork exists in many, in many regards because, well, okay, well, this office knows how to reach this particular population, and, you know, these federal benefits are run through the tax system and all the rest of it, but there is no, like, existing plumbing that is hooked up that would reach everybody that you would need to reach. And we learned that the hard way during COVID, yeah. right? So I think um, my position on, on the basic income piece is sort of like, I'm not saying not basic income, but number one, tell me what you mean. Number two, tell me if you're willing to raise revenues to pay for it. Number three, we have to talk about the administrative part of this to actually make it work. Right. Ginny, do you think this is an idea that has merit? We talked, uh, a lot of people talked today in various... Um, settings about um, dignity and um, some of the more like core human um, instincts around why we care about food security. Um, And I think that we, I think that we would probably all agree that in a dream world, for everyone who can work, if they could have a dignifying job where they're not underemployed and they're employed to the fullest extent of their skills, they're able to provide for their families. Um, in a dream world, I think that's one person providing for a family, by the way, if another person chooses to stay home, at least for me, um, having that optionality. Maybe it's a couple people working part-time, maybe it's two people working full-time. Um, and, and that those people are able to feed their family healthy food and in a way that is culturally aligned with their background and in a way um, that keeps and nourishes their family. That is the dream, right? Um, and so, and, and 
for me, if we can achieve that um, through a healthy economy, and then make up for the gaps through targeted programs, where we distribute taxes that those hardworking people pay to those who either can't work or who are in between jobs or who are struggling, um, to me, that's the best sort of uh, way to work back to public policy solutions. And I worry about universal programs in general uh, because I think that uh, gets away from that dream a little bit. And I also worry, and I especially worry about universal basic income because of how inefficient it is about um, redistributing those tax dollars. Um, and, and Jen could speak to this far better than I could because some of those people lining up at food banks are paying taxes, and this is their taxes that they're paying, mm. that we will be redistributing. And so um, I, I think we just have to keep that in mind. Certainly that's my, my view, and, and I worry that a universal income gets, basic income gets too, too far away from that dream. Right. Tyler, the, the other thing, and, and these things both test better than any programs. All well, the programs are not unpopular. School food's a popular program. Pharmacare is a popular program. Um, but... Testing better than any of those programs is both this idea and a higher minimum wage. So I don't know whether people know what the minimum wage is or think it should be higher or whatever, but I think what people are telling me in the survey in a number of different ways is that too many people are too poor, right? Too many people don't have enough money in Canada, and it's widely recognized that that's the case, right? So what do you think about raising minimum wages or basic incomes or what what is an income support what is a income support way to address that so it's interesting right um minimum wages uh are often described as destroying jobs and so sometimes they're pilloried as you know if you believe that the best social program is a job which some people believe yeah. um and, and and i'll just say for the for the record like if you if you look at what's actually reduced how poverty has reduced in canada over mm -hmm. the last decade um, you know, there's been transfer programs like the Canada Child Benefit that have helped quite a bit in, in, taking, in taking children in particular out of poverty. Things like GIS have helped with taking seniors out of poverty. But the market actually also takes a lot of people out of poverty if it works well. And so some people will say minimum wages are a bad thing because they destroy jobs. Except that the evidence actually shows that on average what it does is it does take some, it takes away some, some job demand. But what it does is it raises the benefit, the welfare of all those people who are at the bottom end of the wage distribution uh, enough that it basically nets off each other. Now, whether it reduces poverty is a different question, but I think we should start from the premise of knowing that the market actually, when, when the economy is good, when our institutions work, when we have a redistributive tax system and we promote good work, Jobs actually do a really good job of helping to take people out of poverty. Now, not enough that that is sufficient. You can't rely on that alone. But jobs actually are an important part. And I think we don't spend enough time thinking about what does a good work agenda look like in order to boost wages, particularly at the low end. And this is an interesting question to ask right now because we're at a time in which the power of labor is stronger than it has been in decades. Even in a time in which there's been high levels of immigration, which typically undercuts the power of labor or has been thought to over time. This is a moment, we talk about scarcity, this is a moment of labor scarcity long term, right? And so this is a moment in which labor has the power to reset the agenda. And I think, you know, personally, I would be more interested in pursuing that than looking at a basic income, only because I think the administrative problems that Jen has talked about, and we can talk about that more in depth um, later on, but, but I, I think that the implementation challenges of getting a basic income program up and running are, are real and significant and a barrier to reform. And there's more that we can do in the short run thinking about a good work, good jobs agenda. Right. Jeannie, this, this low-paying job thing, like I was really stunned when the government of Ontario increased the minimum wage from $11.40 to $14. 35% of Ontario workers got a raise, right? I was stunned that that many people were working for less than $14 an hour. So when you think about the economy, how do, you, how do we get those income levels up? Well, I mean, look, I, I actually don't, I mean, it's relative, right? That, that only feels uh, low because prices are high. If everything costs less, wages could be lower and it wouldn't matter. Like, uh, in practical terms, we only want wages to be higher, prices are high. Now, we can only bring wages down so low. I mean, inflation has cooled, right, and prices are still high. And so we need wages to go up. Um, 
I worry that when you when you think about um, solutions like uh, a minimum wage increase, and maybe periodically you need a, you need to, to 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 bring wages up at, at the very bottom to create a bit of a floor. Um, I'm I'm willing to concede that there are cases where that's true, but I, I'd rather we start with uh, we have pretty anemic growth and pretty anemic productivity in Canada. Um, and we've not solved that problem. There, there are, I don't think there are easy solutions, and I think that's why governments um, of all levels and of all stripes have really, really struggled with this challenge. Um, I don't think it helps, by the way, when you have sort of limitless inbound immigration because it allows big employers to meet um, their demand for workers uh, without having to search for them and and um, for them. In, and increase wages in order to attract them and benefits and all that kind of thing. I think that breaks the market a little bit. Um, and so, like, there are all sorts of other big big challenges. I think we issued us first before we have to turn to something like a, a minimum wage increase. Right. Jennifer, what's the role for tax relief in helping to reduce poverty? You working mean, poverty. Okay. The working poor. Yeah. Right, these right. people with full-time jobs showing up at the food bank. Is there right. a role for tax relief? In this? You mean, like, if we just gave them a tax cut, yeah. would they? <laughs> well, okay, so <laughs> I just want to defend Tyler because I know why he's laughing. And it's because our current tax system right now actually provides a fair amount of tax relief for people who are in lower income, right? Like, by the time you get through the basic personal amount, by the time you get through a variety of other kind of credits and deductions, uh, I don't have the exact... F this is the one time, David, I came without the receipt. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> I'll get back to you on that one. Um, but but there, is, like, there is a threshold beyond which uh, you have to cross over before you're actually paying... You have a net yeah. tax liability, right? So it's not totally clear that if you are a lower-wage worker, even if you're working full-time, full-year, that a tax cut, which is going to be fairly modest, let's be honest, right, in, in terms of those brackets, is going to be meaningful for you. Instead, right, the, the tools are much more around things like the, the refundable tax credits that we've got, like the GST credit, like the Canada Workers Benefit. And there, you know, I think there are important questions to ask. We're indexing them to the overall inflation. Has that actually kept up with some of the, some of the overall price level changes that we're seeing? I think it's an important question. Um, and then there's also the issue of eligible non-participation. So people who are actually entitled to those benefits and aren't getting them. Right? And it would make a meaningful difference in their overall welfare if they were actually just getting the money that they're already eligible for. Right. Can I just build on that point for a second? Because uh, what's, what's interesting, if you do that, that kind of look at the tax system, as Jen was talking about, about who pays taxes, like who pays net taxes and who, who gets back money from the tax system, a lot of people get money back from the tax system actually pretty far up into the income distribution except that it's quite disproportionate who those people are. Those are typically families with kids because we have a social policy architecture in Canada that's focused on kids, largely, because we believe in raising families and the families have lots of costs. And the CCB All in right, particular. JD. Right? Well, no, but it's, well, okay, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> careful now. Um, weird. Uh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, the single cat dad is actually the guy that is poor, right? Like the single, if you look at poverty rates in Canada, unattached singles are the most vulnerable, the most likely to be poor. Those are the working poor. And there's really not a constituency that talks to that group, right? And there isn't, talking about where we started from originally around the politics, there isn't a political party. As much as we're you know, trying to bring in non-voters sometimes, um, and some of, I think, on the right, there's been very successful strategies at that. What I don't see is political parties trying to make the map choice and the policy choice from we need to get those people voting and how do we put the policy in the window that gets those people voting. Unattached singles, who are the single most likely people to be in poverty other than persons with disabilities, are the folks that don't really get representation in the tax system because they don't get the Canada Child Benefit, right? And mm -hmm. uh, they might get something from the Canada Workers Benefit, but it stops at about $30,000, right? And so th there's, a, there's a question there as to, like, do we need to think about, from the tax system side, helping them the way we've built a system of income support for, the, for families and for people who are seniors? Canada's forests are one of our greatest assets an important natural resource that can play a critical role in preserving our environment, building our communities, and growing our economy. 
But with the projected rate of climate change expected to occur 10 to 100 times faster than our forests can migrate naturally, we need to be working with nature to help this renewable resource adapt to a changing climate. Here's how Canada's forest sector is helping. Canadian foresters are working with nature to regenerate harvested areas with trees better adapted to warming temperatures and future climate conditions. These strategies not only consider what was there before, but what species of trees native to a particular area will keep forests healthy and thriving long term. Canadian foresters also use modern methods of harvesting that mimic natural growth cycles. These strategies not only minimize the impact of human intervention in the forest, but also mitigate the impact of the stressors on our forests by prioritizing stands more susceptible to wildfire, insect damage, and disease. These efforts are collectively helping our forests become more resilient to the conditions we can't control and are all part of the active forest management strategies that will help keep our forests as forests forever. Our world is changing. So is Canadian forestry. For more information, visit forestryforthefuture.ca. Jenny, what do you think? Is there a role for the tax system in relieving working poverty? I think there's a role um, for holistically looking at taxation in Canada. Um, one, to look at ways to drive growth, um, whether that's corporate taxes or capital gains taxes or what have you, or ways that were inadvertently stifling growth yeah. um, and, yeah. and ways to alleviate that. Yeah. Um, there certainly is room for individual tax relief. I think carbon tax is an obvious place to do that. Um, even if you want to argue that any one individual person is going to be net neutral at the end of the year after they file their taxes and get their rebate back, I don't think that impacts someone who is struggling to choose between filling their gas with their, their tank of their um, car with gas or, or, afford, or affording groceries um, that week, is, which is what we're talking about, that sort of um, potent security qu a matter that arises on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think there's, there's also room, and this is where um, Jen's probably, um, and, and Tyler are probably much better versed on this than I am, um, but my understanding is that the way um, the system works now is there are um, clawbacks and disincentives when it comes to benefits. And you really, it's hard to get that balance right, but I think it's always worth looking at um, the system to make sure that you're making work, making sure that work pays, right? You're, you're making sure that um, you're not, you don't risk losing benefits if you start working um, or falling off a cl benefit, benefits cliff if your work increases. Particularly if we think that that is the best way for people to have a dignified life is to have a high paying job where they can afford uh, the basics of, and necessities of life. And so um, that's a kind of a, an overly nuanced, probably boring answer. I don't think there's any one easy solution, but I think tax policy has to be part of the solutions bucket. You have something to say. Is it okay if I just jump on the clawback piece yeah, just really quickly, just to just to um, kind of you know uh, join on that part? Um, the clawback part is is actually really really important, right? Um, it does create work disincentives for for folks, and it creates all kinds of negative consequences, right? When you're on more than one benefit, right? When your income goes up, and those 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 clawback rates or those benefit reduction rates are not aligned, um, and uh, at the same time, we also have to remember that there are um, members of our community, some of our neighbors, who have some labor force attachment, but, but work is not going to be the solution for them, right? And um, when, so I, I, just, I just want to say that if we, if we only organize all of our thinking around benefit design, around clawbacks and work incentives, let's not forget the fact that we need to provide basic minimums that are acceptable, right, and provide for, for dignity. I'm thinking specifically here of the Canada Disability Benefit, and if sure. you actually look yeah. at the design of that, Right, uh, there's way too much of a focus on a hugely steep clawback rate, not recognizing the fact that, look, an awful lot of members of the disability community, they might be able to have some work attachment, but this is not going to, like, the disability benefit itself is the important piece. Right? Yeah, agreed, agreed. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, you know, the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, you have to say that, and Labrador. And Labrador. Yeah. Uh, and it's understand it's, Newfoundland. Yeah, right? it's Not tedious, but yeah. you have to say it. And in any event, um, he was saying this morning that he says to his officials, will this work? Will this solve the problem? Yeah. Right? Don't come to me with a proposal that would do something, and then later on we're going to still be the eighth worst province in the country on this thing. Like, will it work? 
it really feels to me like that was a principle that was not applied to the disability benefit. Yeah. Um, I guess my question would be, what positive impact will this have, this money that's been put into it? And what do you think the prospects are for raising the level of that benefit? Right. Uh, okay, where do I even begin? So first of all, I want to preface everything I'm going to say right now by acknowledging that there are people in this room um, who are part of Disability Without Poverty with whom I've had the pleasure of, of working and, and learning from enormously. I also want to preface what I'm going to say by saying 18 months ago, I wouldn't have had the mobility to be here on the stage today. So I'm also sort of, it's changed how I think about this issue. Yeah. Um, I think the, the government's own internal estimates are that the disability benefit is barely going to move the needle on poverty amongst working age adults with disabilities. What they have done essentially is set, here's an overall envelope of money that we are willing to spend, right? Here's the dollar figure and then work their way backwards in terms of figuring out now what are the design criteria of how many people we can afford to send money to? What is a minimum annual amount that we could sort of justify politically as like, well, it's not nothing, right? And then, and then you basically fill in the blanks on around how you design the benefit from there. And not only is it like, it's not going to work in terms of the stated purpose of the legislation, which was to provide for financial security for persons with disabilities and reduce poverty, right? Um, but um, so it's not going to have that desired impact. The other thing that I, that it pisses me off, okay, there, I'm just going to say it, is that uh, there was a commitment, a process commitment. There was a commitment to co-creation, to co-design, to listening to the disability community in terms of the features that they wanted. And if you look at what's actually come out the other end of the pipeline, I just, like, I just, like, it, it, it angers me and it pisses me off and it leaves me with despair because I think it has actually further marginalized many voices of persons with disabilities in policy conversations, and that really worries me, right? It was a, it was a bit of a bait and switch. There, I said it. Right. What does the whole enchilada cost, Jennifer? It's what uh, two, Tyler's going to... Uh, yeah, you, 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 know, know. you know this number better than I do, Tyler. <laughs> well, it rises eventually to about $1.7 billion. I think. No, no, but the whole, if, we, oh. if they'd gone whole hog, Oh, with the lift that. them out of poverty. Oh, okay. So Lindsay, Ted's, and I did a bit of a back of an envelope. We think it was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about ten to twelve billion annually. Okay, conservative. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think conservatives. Well, I can only speak for myself, but I, I think that um, for me, like I said, one of the one of the primary roles of government is to care for people who can't care for themselves. And um, for people who can't work, that means um, cash. Hmm. Uh, there are questions about what is the best level of government to deliver that. But I think the federal government has a burden to deliver that unless it transfers the tax points, right? I, I, I could maybe see a sort of philosophical argument that the federal government should, should transfer tax points to the provinces and municipalities and that this kind of benefit should be more local. Um, but it, it hasn't done that. And so if that's the case, I think you have to look really seriously at enhancing um, the kinds of, and by the way, not spending in areas that um, don't, uh, don't don't serve some of these core function of what, of what government's supposed to do, so that you can uh, fund these kinds of programs properly. Um, in, in our economic environment, it's hard for me to imagine politically that any party um, would be able to go whole hog, especially right away. Um, but working towards that as a goal over time, particularly as you decrease spending in other areas, seems like totally in line with at least my worldview. I can only speak for myself. So just to put that number in context, that is bigger in today's dollars terms than what we are spending on childcare. It took us decades to get the child national childcare Child care is universal, program. though. Ch child care, the childcare program today is benefiting wealthy families who do not need it. So that's exactly where I would find some of the money. But, the, but it's, I mean, the, wealth, but it's the universality of it that actually makes it a politically potent thing to eventually offer, right? That's the challenge okay, but I just we think have it's bad, makes it bad policy. Sure, fair enough. Fair, no, fair <laughs> enough. But, I, but this is what I'm saying is that look at how long it took us to get to a place of getting an $8 billion a year national program. Right? You think, and that's a cost-shared program with, the, with provincial governments. You think that 10 billion to 12 billion that we'll just do tomorrow? No, that's not going to happen, right? Like, and so it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise to well, anybody. Well, why? Just, you say that, but let me, you know, it sounds cynical. Let me ask you, right? So the current program, as you said, ramps up to something close to $2 billion, right? Yeah. That's sort of walking around money for this government. Um, <laughs> so, um, fair enough. When it, when it comes to $8 billion, Right yeah. or something like that, like what's the discussion inside a government 
and I don't mean to pick on these people, you're just part of those discussions. Yeah. We'll, go, well, should we lift them out of poverty? No, I don't think we should lift them out of poverty. We should just give them a couple hundred dollars. Like, how does that conversation go? Well, so that conversation also acknowledges the fact that I think your polling shows, which is if you say it as $2,400 a year, most Canadians nod their heads and say, that's fantastic, yeah. right? And so they understand politically that you can get through the negative feedback that you're going to get naturally from stakeholders who will rightly say that's not going to help many people. The government's own modeling is that it will take about 10,000 people out of poverty in an environment where... I think something like 600,000 people with disabilities, is that right? Yeah. Um, have, or, anyway, um, but 10,000, right? That's not a huge number, right? So um, uh, at the end of the day, right, at the end of the day, uh, they, they, they know that they can, they can speak to the average person who thinks that that's a worthy thing to do because on a values basis we care about giving money to people. The problem is that the general public doesn't understand how woefully inadequate our income security system is in Canada. A person with a disability in Canada has a total welfare income, depending on which province that they're in, somewhere between twelve dollars and $23,000 a year. In most places of the country, the market basket measure, I believe, is around $29,000, $30,000. Ballpark, in, like yeah. in a big urban setting. Yeah, so, so like even what we offer in we total welfare incomes, when you add up all the things that we offer now, most people get about 70% of the way to that poverty. Some people get 70% of the way to that, to that poverty threshold. And so there's a long distance that we have have to go if we actually want to solve that problem. And most people don't realize that it's actually a really big distance for a lot of people with disabilities. Now look, I'm a person with a disability. I was born visually impaired blind. I happen to receive the disability tax credit, not for any other reason than the fact that I was born as blind. And because we don't have a definition in this country of who a person with a disability is, because we can't agree on what that is, mm. it, there's differences between episodic illnesses and people who've been born with something. But of course, if you're born with something, is that really necessarily a disability? Like in my case, I don't consider myself disabled. I am, but I don't consider myself disabled. Um, but yet the tax system gives me... It's not really me, setting you back. No, exactly. But yeah. this is my point. The tax you're system well. gives me... The tax <laughs> system gives me a credit every year that's worth about 1500 bucks in my tax form. Okay? Right. I don't really need that. Right? And there are people like me who don't need that, who are considered disabled in our system, that we, we could be taking that money and putting it to much better use. So mm -hmm. if we actually don't, it, like there's some things, it's not going to magically change this problem of how do we find $10 billion. But there are some things that we could do if we wanted to arrive at a definition of what a common, what a common definition of disability is in this country. Mm -hmm. We could be focusing on that problem and it would actually help to design these systems more intelligently. The last thing I'll say, is that I think the reason we are in this boat with the Canada Disability Benefit is actually a fault of both stakeholders in Parliament. And I'm sorry to say that, that may upset some people in this room, but that is the case. We made a process mistake in how the Canada Disability Benefit was designed. Because what happened was we said, let's approve a piece of legislation that commits government to do a statutory benefit without agreeing first on what that design is or the objective is. So if we had we'd actually started the process of saying, let's take every person with disability out of poverty, it would have been hard, it would have been a long process, but I actually think in this minority parliament, we could have pressured people to commit to that because it's a values-based thing the Canadians themselves, as Jerome Poling says, that we agree on. But we didn't do that because we saw a fast way to go and get a statutory benefit that then could be designed without having to go back through parliament and do by regulation. Funny enough, when you do that, it becomes a budget issue. It becomes a what can you afford issue. And that's why you spend $2 billion on it and not $10 billion on it. I just wanted to pick up on two things that Tyler said there, which is, first of all, I think you make a really important point about the DTC. And yeah. so, so notwithstanding the fact that I have been like really Debbie Downer on the disability benefit, I just want to say one thing. If nothing else, maybe two things positive can come out of this. Number one, focused attention on the disability tax credit and the urgent need for reform there. I mean, it is, it is administratively hugely yeah. burdensome. Anybody who difficult has, for people to apply for it. It's yeah. difficult for people to apply for it. And even if, if you apply, um, you know, CRA may send you back to go and get, you know, this form verified again, or did your leg grow back? You know, can we, you know, like, it's insane. Um, so there's that part of it that I think actually maybe, the, maybe now there's a window to have that conversation. And the other thing I will say is that it's what now, six out of 12 provinces that have said they will not be clawing back their provincial income support for persons with disabilities as a result of the benefit. And that's actually a level of, of cooperation federally and provincially that is really important materially um, you know, impacts people's welfare at the end of the day. And so maybe that's also a positive thing to come out of this. Okay. Well, Ginny, the flavor of the day seems to be school food. Um, federal government announced a school food program. Most provinces are actively pursuing school food programs. Um, 
What do you think about that approach? Is that a proper role for the state? I think there's a role for the state. I'm not sure about the federal government. Um, okay. To me, this is an example of... Well, actually, let me take a step back and I'll, I will answer your question. Um, I think sometimes conservatives make the mistake of talking only about um, state-administered programs um, and assuming that people get <laughs> that part of the equation in pulling back on government-administered programs is the role of charitable um, organizations, uh, faith-based organizations, community institutions, um, extended family, I mean, all kinds of... Uh, we, heard, we heard from um, non some, some nonprofits and charitable institutions today that are doing really great work. Um, in some cases, that's funded by government or, or funded in part by government. Sometimes it's funded by uh, philanthropy. Um, so, I, and I think, by the way, there are policies that can contribute to a more robust um, charitable environment. Um, I, I, I think we could have better tax treatment and tax policy for um, charitable giving and charitable um, organizations, for instance. We don't have a culture in Canada of charitable giving that's as robust as it could be, and I think policy can impact that. And so that's one piece. And I think um, there's a real important role for, um, for the charitable world to play uh, when it comes to food, food security, and food for kids. Um, schools are the obvious place that for kids who are in poverty, um, just the simple relief of having a meal um, in the middle of the day or a snack, a snack and a meal or, or whatever, and the, the relief for the, the parents of those kids. Um, and I, I think it's also a place where the universality of it can address some of the stigma challenges for people. Um, and this question of dignity, I think that that's, destigmatization is important. Um, but it seems to me, particularly when you take in, into account cultural considerations, um, local administration and um, uh, uh, sort of having a small tax base that then pays for those programs at a local level based on exactly what those people want in those communities is the best way to think about it. Um, I'm also a proponent of school choice. Like, there's so many ways uh, that I would change the way schools are even set up um, school boards are set up, and how these kinds of programs are administered. Um, and now, that doesn't exist today. And so my, my instinct on, on school food programs, particularly in a scarcity environment where you have probably a change in government federally, probably a government that's going to look at reduce, reducing spending, um, focusing advocacy on local administration, at least at the provincial level, if not at the municipal level, of these kinds of programs is, I think, um, makes a lot more sense in that kind of environment because um, you have a smaller pool of people being taxed, being able to choose, pick and choose, and, and vote with their feet when it comes to what, what kind of services they want. i stick with you for a second. You mentioned the universality of school food, and certainly stigma at the school is, is an important consideration in that. I also assume, though, the cynical part of me assumes that one of the reasons why this idea is gaining traction among governments is because in addition to being a poverty or food security program, it's also a middle class affordability program. Totally. Yes. Right? And, and a middle class um, practicality problem. I mean, my, my husband, our, my son's um, just started junior kindergarten, and actually he's in a TDSB school in Toronto that has a uh, grandfathered uh, program, uh, lunch program, because it was a historically underserved neighborhood. The neighborhood is no longer underserved. I mean, it's a mixed population, certainly, and there'd be uh, kids and families who are underserved, but um, as a result, my kid gets a highly subsidized meal, and he doesn't need it. But let me tell you, it's very practical for us, um, and I think that would be true for a lot of parents who um, are struggling with the... And, you know, people's choices and um, circumstances, they don't think of them in discrete public policy terms, right? They think, my life is really stressful right now. Um, I just bought groceries that I could barely afford. Now I have to rush because we have a two-parent working household to make my kid lunch in the morning when we're already, you know, behind. And resolving all of those problems together, like the school, a school food program, I think, just feels like a real big easy fix for people who are struggling and insecure in a lot of different ways. And I think that is true for middle-class people, upper-middle-class people, honestly, um, particularly in the in this sort of like late inflationary environment that we're in where prices are really high. And so I think public policymakers have to be careful about the, the political potency of a program that maybe isn't the most efficacious um, way to spend taxpayer money if you want to target poverty. And I think it's, it's similar to childcare in that way, honestly. I think it's very tempting politically. Um, and I think you just have to make sure that when you're designing these programs, you're thinking about the cost and making sure the cost is as directed as, as 
well as possible towards the goal. And if the goal is poverty alleviation, you have to be careful about that. Mm. Tyler, school food is an issue you actually threw your shoulder behind. Yep. Um, and pushed forward yep. um, with some success. Um, are you happy with the result? And why were you motivated to push that issue? So uh, I was motivated to push that issue because I got convinced on that issue a few years ago when we were writing the 2021 uh, platform and it was one of the things that was outstanding that we hadn't done and I just think it's a perfect policy as Jenny says, it's a perfect policy for now, right? For governments that are looking for things to do to help solve problems for people when food and the cost of essential goods is the number one or number two issue in any poll, it's, a, it's perfectly telegraphed to the moment. Even if it doesn't help everybody, it, it's at least something. And it's something that it's very hard to argue with. And it's, it's, it just makes sense, right? It, it makes sense, especially if you carry the logical conclusion in this inflationary environment that we've lived through, there's an opportunity there to actually reduce the cost of food in those programs because you can also do bulk buying if you want to. That's one version that some people, uh, some, some permutations of the program, well, even not necessarily one that the federal government has to push, but, but it just it fits on so many levels is my point. I'm, look, I'm, I'm not surprised with how it's ended up because we, the government basically announced that it would do what it said it would do in the 2021 platform. It hasn't expanded or enhanced that. There could be opportunities to do that as, as we go further down the track. But I think what will be interesting to watch is how quickly can the government actually get out there and sign these agreements with provinces. So you had Andrew Fury earlier here at the conference. I believe Newfoundland was the first province to yep. sign an agreement. Congratulations to him. It's the right thing to do. It's a great political thing to do. Um, I think the question will be if this program can be stood up Money can get out the door. Kids can actually start being fed. A, does that create the conditions that we move from a targeted program to a more universal program? I know Ginny has some concerns maybe about that, but is like this, the, the politics take us in that direction? And the second is, if it stood up quickly enough, can it then sustain the possibility, if there is a change in government, of the Conservatives wanting to cut it? And I think that will be an interesting question because I suspect this will be very hard to cut as a program because it is popular. In fact, I've seen some polling that suggests 70% of conservatives actually believe in this program. And so it's the kind of thing that we should all be happy about. There's a consensus in this country that we should feed kids. Let's get on with it. All right, all right doctor, is it gonna make a difference, this program? Great question. Um, well, I think the, the, the commitment at the federal level is to enhance access to existing programs yeah. for what, about half, half Four, 400,000. 400,000 yeah. yeah. more, more kids. Yeah. Um, that's not nothing. That's not nothing. But of course, the details, you know, to be determined. And it's cost shared. So you're into a world of having to negotiate with provinces, some of whom are a little less keen on having the federal government in their backyard on some of these issues. Right. Um, you know, I... I, I would like to see some, some you know, uh, I would like to see some, some evaluation, right, of, of how this is actually rolling out. I have no issue. Sounding to me like it wouldn't have been your priority. Uh, look, I, I will say, I, as I have been the parent that threw the $5 at the, you know, let's buy, for, buy pizzas on Friday for the kids so I don't have to pack lunch. <laughs> We've all been there. I've been there. <laughs> I have done that. Um, um, I guess... Um, it, it, the issue that I have, right, is do we know that there is capacity within um, the nonprofit sector that is often the delivery agent for these food yeah. programs to scale up? Um, that's really important, right? Um, I think there's also a question of, in addition to, okay, I'm going to get really corny here, David, I'm sorry. Really? Really, totally corny. Um, in addition to uh, worrying about um, providing, you know, a nutritious, inclusive meal that is non-stigmatizing, because this really does have to be delivered in a way that we're not using school food um, as the identifier for kids in need. Um, but there's also an opportunity here, I think, that we're missing out on to also uh, work into the school curriculum, you know, much better understanding of our food production systems and an attachment to food production and food creation, all the rest of it. So, you know what I mean? I just, I would have liked to see it um, maybe be a little bit more I mean, I think Canadians know nothing about where their food comes from, no. and they're happy that way. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that. You know what? I mean, like... I just, I looked this up. So StatCan asked, asked Canadians, like, do you grow anything? It turns out 61% grow, like, fruits, vegetables, or a flower from here, you know, from time to time. So, like, there actually, I think there is actually a bit of a subculture of, of weird gardener people like right. me. Maybe There's not no flower tax. Maybe not no. animals. No, no. Flower no. Tax. Maybe <laughs> flowers, but not animals, <laughs> I don't yeah. think. No, yeah. no. 
Uh, so we're getting low on time. There's one issue I really want to touch on because it's been obviously a big focus of the day today. And this is this idea about prescribing food to people who are developing illnesses. Um, and Tyler, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. So this is an idea where when a doctor says, you know, the fundamental problem with this person is that they're not eating enough fruits and vegetables, that the answer to that shouldn't be a pill. The answer to that should be prescribing them fruit and vegetables, giving them the means to go, to go get that. Do you see that as the kind of idea that could ever have traction internally? So it's interesting. Th this is not uh, an idea that it doesn't exist uh, in, or just exists in theory. It has been practiced in a few places, and I think it's interesting to look at because uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada just released a bit of a study of what um, what is out there, what this, how has this practice been done, and what does the literature show? And what's interesting is, you know, in the U.S., there's been some research done because uh, there was a there was a pilot project of this inserted into the U.S. Farm Bill. Of course, it was inserted into the U.S. Farm Bill, where you know lots All of other things. Are, lie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and what it found, of course, is uh, it had some benefits, obviously, to improving um, uh, use of or, or consumption of fruits and vegetables, so it improved nutrition. It also uh, had some benefits associated with, you know, if you just improve the diet, that, that had uh, more fruits and vegetables. But it, but it didn't necessarily, on all of the metrics of, of, of health, uh, move the needle on, on, a, on a pre versus post analysis. Um, I think there's a question there about what is it the intended outcome that we're looking for? If we're just talking about fruits and vegetables, maybe that's not enough. Um, if we're using this, though, as an as a entry point to a broader discussion about is there, you know, can we use the health system to prescribe for vouchers or some version of that that, that enables people to get either income or food that they need, that, that, that actually might have some merit. Um, but I, I do worry about, uh, the, in a sense, the paternalism uh, of this, just because uh, I think... Poor people certainly want to have agency over what they want to consume. And, and I think we have to be careful about inserting ourselves into those decisions. It may seem a bit odd for me, me to say that, but... Um, Music uh, to my ears. You mean not everybody who's not eating enough fruits and vegetables <laughs> yeah. is yeah. Make, perhaps making that choice? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exa yeah, exactly, right? And so I do, I do worry about that. I think that that's a legitimate policy issue we have to sort out. But again, the research would suggest that where this has been done, there are some improvements, some improvements on health, and that is a good thing. And so I think it merits further study. Um, but at the end of the day, I generally start from the premise that the problem is mostly a lack of income. And so how do we solve for that? And we put around people the public goods that they need, whether that's housing, whether that's a good job, uh, or whether that's a stable income. Well, I certainly agree with your point about uh, paternalism. Because if you ask my wife, Terry, if you put a Big Mac in front of me, I'll eat it. If you put a Big <laughs> Mac and a banana in front of me, I will eat the Big Mac. Um, so, <laughs> um, Ginny, you were nodding as, as uh, Tyler was talking about that. Yeah. First of all, double cheeseburger for me. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, Bacon? Uh, there's no... <laughs> no. No? No, I'll pass. Okay. Um, definitely fries, though. You know, it's a Maple Leaf event, eh? Yeah, good point. Um, <laughs> there, there's no question that we have a problem with food, uh, and it's affecting our health. Um, I, if I was going to look at the healthcare system, there are probably other places I'd start. Anyone who's been in the hospital knows hospitals somehow give the worst food to people and feed the worst food to people. Like, how is that the case that we, you know? Um, and so I think there's, like, some... Um, there's some deeper ways that um, uh, that were people are ill-served um, in our economy and in our body politic when it comes to food and the type of food that they eat. I just am really skeptical of um, yeah the, the paternalism, the um, the the you know the the optics of. Um, an organization saying to someone who is low income, here, here's this healthy food. By the way, there's a reason that, there are all kinds of reasons why we've ended up where we are. Um, convenience is a potent uh, force. And if you deliver a box of vegetables to someone's house, and it's a single mom with three kids who's, you know, just get scraping by, uh, if I were her, I'd throw it back in your face. Like, you know, <laughs> um, that's not what I need right now. Uh, I, uh, I need a quick meal for my kids um, so that I can, uh, you know, quick, feed them quickly between the two jobs that I'm working. And so, yeah, I really, now, I, I don't want to, I sound so cynical. I'm sure that um, there are instances of um, 
you know, healthy meals, being served to the right people in convenient ways, and that that's been a difference maker. Uh, Tyler spoke to some of um, some 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 of the evidence there. I just think uh, public policy is about trade offs. And there are, um, I think, a lot of better, faster ways we can have impact on poverty than, uh, than something that prescriptive. Okay, Jen? So, um, I always, when we're talking about like, prescribing food, I always think about, okay, so the, the fundamental issue here is how do you fill the prescription, right? And um, we actually have existing systems all across this country that are already built into part of our income security system through social assistance, where you can apply for a dietary supplement. The problem is that they are incredibly restrictive in terms of the range of diagnoses that they will um, that they will recognize. They are also incredibly restrictive in terms of the actual dollar amounts that they will give. So, you know, here in Ontario, I think if it's if you've got diabetes, I think oh maybe you can qualify for an extra eighty one bucks a month if you're on Ontario Works. If you're in BC, I think it's only like fifty bucks or something like that, right? So like there's there is a system there that we that I think deserves a good long hard look at the provincial level. Um, and then, in terms of how do you uh, how do you fill the script? I think that you know there's there's also been models like at, at uh, St. Michael's of prescribing income, like hey let's and I know there are some folks here from uh, from one of the other uh, children's hospitals here in town um, that have been doing similar things in terms of trying to connect families to benefits to actually improve their purchasing power. So I think we want to be careful about not treading down the path of like food vouchers, like food stamps, that are prescriptive in terms of what you can and cannot redeem these for, and that still keep you connected to, you know, food, food distribution and production systems that are not always, you know, easily accessible and responsive and whatnot. And that's why I also think that there are some interesting models to be had in terms of the, the, <coughs> um, the, the social prescribing that is also connected to um, um, local food production. Um, outfits, right? Like so, like food share, for example, here in Toronto. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Interesting. Okay. My last question is going to be quite practical for this group. This room is full of people who are on the ground trying to give food to people who need it. They they want the year of government. They want to be able to get. They want to be. Adv- they want to be effective advocates to policymakers. Tyler, you've written fall economic statements, budgets, party platforms. Do you have any practical advice for these people as to how to penetrate what seems to be impenetrable? So if your goal is to expand the Canada Disability Benefit, you need to do a lot more work on political advocacy. And the reason I say that is because, you know, polling suggests CDB in the budget was 70% um, support. Yep. People think it's a winner. And so if you don't think it's a winner, you've got to change that. How are you going to change that? You're going to change that by either getting the NDP to make it an issue of one of the two or three things that they care about <coughs> the government on, because they still have, even without the supply and confidence agreement, they still have the ability to negotiate something. Government needs support in a confidence motion. You should go and try to push on that door. Or the Bloc Québécois. Or get the Conservatives to say something in advance of the next election because they have not expressed, apart from saying that they support it, they voted against the budget that contained it. And so we don't know where they stand. They, they haven't said what they would do. We don't know. I mean, they should be put on the record, right? And so if I were them, that was what I would be doing, is how to push on those political doors because right now people think it's a winner. If you don't think it's a winner, you've got to change that. Okay. Just quickly stay with you. How do you present these ideas to people? For, and one of the things I was asked, one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, on this food prescribing thing, there's this notion that um, over time it pays for itself, right? And I know that when I was in government, I was always incredibly skeptical about these claims, which mm-hmm. come at you often, that this expenditure will pay for itself. So, Tyler, do you have any advice about how to package things for government years? Or political so, years. Well, I, like I think, especially as we're talking about the federal government or even the provincial government in Ontario, we're going into election cycles, right? And so I would be thinking about trying to say, how is your specific idea, whether it's prescribing for, uh, you know, for, ve- for fruits and vegetables or whether it's expanding the CDB in the right way, how will that move the needle in a political constituency? If you can tell me in the specific voting groups where I need, if I'm a center-left party that's looking for a way to reestablish itself with credibility with people, how is this going to move that needle? So, David, your, your polling says that maybe it does move the needle. People in government need to hear that. that. We're at that political moment right now, right? We're entering a cycle in the next year federally, and we're going to have an election probably before that provincially. People need to know what is the political impact of, move, of making a commitment in this space. Ginny, I think it's probably fair to say, although I've not canvassed the group, 
that, well, first of all, you mentioned earlier that there's likely going to be a poly of government. I would double down on that. If there were facts in the future, that would be one. Um, so uh, I, I, I assume there's a fair bit of trepidation among the people in this room about what that government will be like. Do you have any advice to these people about how they should talk to a poly of government or a poly of party right now? Take his advice. Um, I, well, I would take what Tyler said and go further. Don't just tell me, show me. Yeah. Um, as much as you can leverage the individual voices of impacted people to advocate, to either advocate for the, the change that you want to see um, or, the, or to the preservation of the policy that you want, um, the better, and, um, and, and increase the pain threshold for canceling something that you don't want to see canceled. Um, and the way to increase that pain threshold is to say there are to, to to make it very clear to any politician, but we're talking about conservatives right now, conservative candidates, sitting conservative MPs who will be candidates, and their political leader. Um, it, these are the individual people, um, at their individual stories, and uh, the reason that they want Program X, not an academic argument. Um, uh, uh, delivered from on high, um, although that might be more efficient, <laughs> um, but an um, individual on the ground argument delivered in a um, colorful, narrative oriented way um, to the individual people who are trying to get elected or re elected. Um, and that, that like lived experience um, on the ground benefit is the single best way to advocate and, uh, and try to achieve what you want. Thank you. Jen, you have worked in official Ottawa. Yeah. Right? Do they look for something different when you're talking to officials as opposed yeah. to the political branch? Thank you. What Thank are they looking for, for? Thank you for that pitch. Because I, I, the, <laughs> these two are tough to follow because you can see why they are um, recognized as experts for what they do in terms of giving um, sound advice. At the officials level, um, they don't care about is this moving uh, votes, right? They don't care, are, are people hearing this when they're knocking doors? That's not their job. What they do care about are the details of show me the problem, what is the cost of doing nothing, what, is, what are the details of what you were asking me to do, right? And I think that that often gets, gets missed, right, in terms of we, we have a tendency to sort of say, like, well, that's for you to figure out. That's an implementation issue. No, no, no. Like, if you've got views on implementation. You want to see it done a certain way. Come to the conversation with, like, practically, um, you know, this is exactly how we would like to see this done. And last but not least, wherever possible, and especially in the coming environment at, at the federal level, and frankly, even here provincially in Ontario too, to the extent that you can identify ways of paying for this, right? Like, what, what, would, you, what would you not do instead in order to be able to afford this? Or how would you find other revenues or cost sharing or those sorts of things? Like, I know it sounds like I'm asking folks to do some of the work of the public service. And yeah, I kind of <laughs> am, because that's actually probably where you're going to have the greatest success. Whatever the stripe of government, at the end of the day, they're going to be relying on their officials to help them figure out the implementation and actually launch something. So those are the folks that you need to, to work with. Let me just follow up with the three of you on the point that you just made at the end there, because I think it's kind of important. There's a lot of talk, and I don't know whether it's apo you know, apocryphal or not. There's a lot of talk about the diminished policy capacity within governments um, at the officials level. And I'm wondering, to be effective, how fully baked should your proposal be when you bring it to the government now? I mean, you're really close to writing the thing, or are you still good coming with an idea? Look, I would say that you should view this as an iterative exercise, right? You don't have to have it. You don't have to have the memorandum cabinet written out before you, you ask for meeting one, right? But you should be thinking about what are the elements of, of, the, of the process that they need to be able to fill in. And so let's start a conversation of information sharing and ideas so that you are actually working with them as they are trying to advance it through the, through the machinery. Cool. As a platform writer, what are you looking for? Are you looking for literally something you can cut and paste? Or are you looking for an idea that you want to develop yourself? <laughs> well, it's a, so I'm glad you said platform because um, 
in a budget pro, it's different from pl uh, between platform and budget, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of stakeholders think that the two are the same and they're not. In a budget, I need you to be more specific about what specifically you want and concretely you want because I need to take that and run it into the public service. If I don't have the parameters to design it, I don't have a lot of time when I'm making 300, when my minister is making 300 decisions to go and figure out the solution to your problem that you've now convinced me on. If you've got a problem, you've got to come with me to help solve that problem. On a platform, you need to tell me more of a story. I don't need to have it all figured out because actually I have time and space to design that. But you need to convince me that the narrative matters for why I'm going to want to run a campaign on that specific issue or to connect it to a larger set of issues. And so to, you know, to Ginny's point, the, the, the political mobilization kind of matters in that context, certainly. Um, but, but I think it, it, it's about telling me the story of how does this connect to a problem that is really real for people. A lot of stakeholders come to you with an idea saying, if you just put 20 million into this strategy, we call it a strategy, somehow we're going to solve people's problems. BS, you're not going to solve people's problems with $20 million. If you could do that, we would have solved all the problems with the $600 billion that we spent as a government, right? Mm -hmm. like, so so you've, got to, you've got to show me that there's an actual real problem in people's lives and that the scale of the intervention matches how to solve meaningfully that problem. Okay. Jenny, anything to add? Um, use our policy infrastructure in Canada to trial balloon yeah. your solutions. And this is where, you know, I'll give credit to our host today, the Center for Food Security, um, if you can create environments for thought leadership where you lead on key issues, test them out, um, test some arguments in the public, get some media coverage, get some um, noted thought leaders who are well-read writing about your issue, um, this kind of stuff really matters, um, especially when you have a public service that is um, weaker on the policy development um, side of things because it both um, does some of the policy development work for them and it also um, uh, checks a political box on road testing, trial ballooning, getting some ideas out there, and, and getting the public used to them first, and creating, creating demand. We talk about this a lot in public affairs. Creating some demand for um, the solution you want helps government a lot when it comes to taking it up. Great. All right. Listen, thank you all for listening so patiently to us and for your kindness and gentleness in response. I want to thank these three people uh, for being here and for being so insightful, candid with us, giving us so much value. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsors, CN Rail and Forestry for the Future, and the Maple Leaf Center for Food Security.